And Father, we thank you uh, that we can come into your presence this morning and that just as we are uh, excited to be here and uh, looking forward to what you have to say to us, you have been looking forward to meeting with us as well. And though we meet with you uh, each day outside of class, there's something special about the gathered body of Christ. And so we come to you as your bride and we thank you that you as groom have come to us to invite us into your presence because of your sacrifice for us. And Lord, we come with shabby clothes on and you dress us in your righteousness, not what we have earned or not earned, but what you deserve. And so we come this morning as your bride um, to dance with you at the wedding feast. And so, Lord, we come with gratitude and really with um, great humility because you've done it all for us. And so this morning, we listen to what you have to say. And though the things that we might be going over today seem sort of technical or um, a broad brush, we pray that you will, through the course of this study, you will minister deeply to our hearts and feed us while we are in your presence. We lift up to you these many people on the board people that you love and we love as well. We rejoice with some and with some we have heavy hearts. And so those that have such uh, deep needs, Lord, we bring them into your presence and ask for your goodness and your grace to enfold them and minister to their needs. We pray that for ourselves as well, Lord. We lift ourselves up to you and ask that you would um, work in our lives and in the lives of our family, the things that are pleasing in your sight, that you would bless us, and Lord, that you would make us a blessing. So we pray these things in the name of Jesus who is our Lord and our Savior and our great high priest. Lord, he, you are everything to us. And we pray these things because of you. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be looking at um, kind of an overview of Matthew today. <coughs> and I, I saw a couple of papers that had a bunch of... Um, the, 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 these pages were just completely filled up. I don't, I, I, Evelyn, I don't know how she's going to figure out what the title was because she had so much written in there. I mean, I never saw so much writing before in my life. So that, 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 okay. And, and, and you know, I, I do not come around and check homework. I was just commenting upon what a thorough job she had done. Um, but as you all can tell, I can count the 28 and I can write them, I hopefully in order, and I didn't skip any of them. But I've sort of put the, the chart up there on the board. And <clears throat> we're going to look at these different uh, chapter titles. And like I said, this is not... Um, you know, well, let me just pause and say, this is um, not the most in-depth spiritual uh, lesson that we're going to ever have. Um, but we need to understand the framework of how Matthew is, as a gospel is put together. Because, you know, I think in the church, we have heard Sunday school lessons, we have heard sermons, and we pull this little thing out and we look at that little thing, and we pull this thing out and we look at it. And so I can remember as a young person sort of 
you know, I think of Abraham and Jonah and Peter, all kind of knew each other, you know, when they lived hundreds and thousands of years apart. And so um, it's important to understand the structure of the gospel that we're studying to understand why this guy put these stories in here and why he put it in this spot in the gospel. And when we understand that, it, it makes all of the other things more meaningful. So all the things, you, little snippets you've heard of in the sermons can kind of come together and have greater meaning for us. So that's what we're trying to do today. So I'm going to give you some kind of big picture things that you can uh, use to kind of hang things on that, that you go to other places. Um, you know, if we were writing a, a biography of Jesus, the gospel is not really a biography, by the way. It, it's the good news. It tells us something about Jesus. The gospel writer has something in mind for us to take away. It's not just telling us about his life and what he did. It's using those elements to, t to tell us something about who Jesus was and is. And, and I mean, he doesn't want us to just finish this gospel and say, oh, well, wasn't that nice? Which is what a lot of us do, isn't it? Yeah. After a sermon, well, wasn't that nice? You know, nice is about one of the worst things that you can say about a sermon. <laughs> because it should be either comforting or convicting. I had a friend who used to say that God came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And so um, our, our sermons should not be nice. Um, and so uh, hopefully this lesson will be nice, but it will give you something to, to, <laughs> to uh, hang your hat on or hang your knowledge on. Okay, so, um, you know, if we were writing a biography of Jesus, we would probably put in all kinds of things about his childhood, wouldn't we? We don't really know is anything there, about his childhood. About his childhood. Huh? Because there's so little about his childhood. But well, that, it's, not, own. it's not considered important. Um, but let, let's look at these various chapters. Uh, what did you put for chapter one? And I'm not going to write all these on the board, but um, if you, as people say them aloud, uh, you can write, you can fill them in. And I'm going to write some of the um, big picture things on the board, okay? So what did you put for chapter one? Genealogy. genealogy. And? The birth of Jesus. Okay. Birth the genealogy and the birth. So that's the beginnings, right? And then um, in chapter two, it's kind of, really chapters one and two go together, don't they? Because chapter two, two does tell us something about Jesus' early life, although nothing uh, real personal. It tells us more about Joseph, doesn't it? And uh, let's, we're going to be thinking about Joseph. You will be um, looking at him and doing a character study on Joseph and what all you learn about Joseph from the little that we have in Scripture to, to teach us. You know, God was concerned about the stepfather. He had to be right, too. Okay. So in Chapter 2, we learn about um, Jesus' early life, how um, Mary and Joseph had to... Um, or the visit of the Magi, and then the flight into Egypt. And then, chapter 3, I thought we were studying the gospel of Jesus, and all of a sudden, who are we learning about? John. Okay, we have to learn about John because we have to understand the significance of, well, why was it important that John baptized Jesus? So we learn a little about John, and then we learn about uh, Jesus' baptism. And then what do we learn in chapter 4? He was tempted and began preaching. Okay, so the temptation. So I'm going to say that, um, and we'll see how this works. See if, uh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Is that through three or four? Four. Okay, I'm going to put, this is the, this is going to be, there's going to be some alliteration, ladies. Oh, Helps okay. you remember it. <laughs> now the, the 
preparation P is, the, is going to be the alliteration, okay? So that's the preparation of the Messiah. Background and preparation of the Messiah. Now, we have talked about um, last week that there are uh, <coughs> several um, teachings or discourses in the book. And you all know what's coming next, what comes next in 5 through 7. Yeah, it's okay, we'll have to do that in red too. I'm going to do this in a different color because this is the I can't see it. That's the Sermon on the Mount and that is the first um, that's the first disc major discourse and you all know that and some of you in circles last year studied that in detail over the nine months of your circle uh, meetings. <clears throat> but if you didn't, it's okay. Uh, I will still. And so this is the proclamation to carry on the P, okay? So we're going to see that that um, after Jesus begins his ministry, this is the beginning of his ministry, the very first thing is his teaching, his basic teaching that we learn in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we go into, um, so we have the Beatitudes, we have a whole big section in there on um, the relationship Jesus' relationship to the law, the, the relationship of his ideas, his uh, interpretation of the law, and really how that differed from the interpretation of his day. Because the Pharisees loved the law as well, only they had certain interpretations of the law, and it was those interpretations that Jesus came to... Um, uh, criticized, not the law itself. It was their interpretation called the, the uh, tradition of the elders. And so we see Jesus goes through a number of the laws, like we think of murder and adultery and oaths and other different the things. Ten and he, it, it's the Ten Commandments, and he takes a number of those and he says how his interpretation is different from that of the current leadership in Jerusalem. Okay? So um, so as he's um, making his interpretation of the law, or presenting that, he's also rejecting the Pharisees' interpretation because it's different. And then he talks about how you enter the kingdom of God towards the end of the sermon. So sort of three different sections of the sermon. And we will, we will talk about that in detail, of course, as we go through. So then, what do, what do we see in chapter 8? He starts healing. Okay. There are healings. Miracles. That's right. Okay. And the casting out demons. Um, and in chapter 9, we see more uh, miracles. And in chapter 10, we see Jesus sending out the twelve to do ministry. So um, we have 8, 9, and 10. And this is the power of the Messiah. Hey, power. So notice the... Um, the teachings are all clumped together in one spot, and then the miracles are kind of clumped together in one spot. So I, I don't think that the Sermon on the Mount was necessarily just one sermon one time. It's just like um, if you have, um, well, like, let's just use Billy Graham as an example. Um, his sermons were pretty much the same thing every time, weren't they? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we could kind of summarize what Billy Graham's sermons were like, couldn't we? Because he preached, his message was consistent. He preached the same thing. That's not because he didn't know anything else. It's because he was concentrating on one primary message, and he had different audiences, different places, and so he preached the same thing. And I'm sure the same thing was with Jesus. He preached, you know, he'd go to this little town and preach a little while, go to this one and preach. It was the same message. He was trying to get across the same point. And then uh, the writer has selected certain miracles to present, and we're going to talk about why um, the Messiah did miracles. Uh, We're not going to talk about that right now. We're going to wait and talk about that later. Okay? But so the power of the Messiah... And then, let's start with um, chapter uh, 11 through, um, well, let's see, I missed here, chapter 10 is another, um, I'm going to mark all the discourses with um, a, a star like that, okay, they're the discourses. That one, when he is instructing the disciples. As he sent them out, he gave them instructions. And of course, all of this, the teaching and the, the miracle working before I mean, provided instructions for the disciples too. But that chapter 10 is one of your major discourses. Then, uh, we might as well mark 13 down here too. What, what do we have in 13? Parables. Okay, parables. And I'm on the parables. That that is a, a major teaching um, discourse as well in chapter 13. So you can see that these discourses are spaced um, throughout the gospel at intervals, and then other different things happen in between these discourses. Now, look at 11 through 16. Let's kind of group that uh, together. Answer. Yes. A discourse. Define. Well, a teaching, you know, a teaching. like a, not like a sermon, but like um, a, a, a message. A group, of, yeah, a message. Yeah. A discourse is like a proclamation. So you you would have like um, 11 through 16. If you look at that, um, 11. What is that about? He affirms his sonship. Okay. Okay. Who is he talking about? John's disciples. Okay. And so what's happened to John there? Prison. And going to be what? Okay. He's, he's rejected, right? Yeah. And when John is killed, that is a premonition of what's going to happen to Jesus, right? Because if they rejected John the authorities, they're going to reject Jesus. So we see um, the culture's rejection of John the Baptist and Jesus' ministry as well. And we're going to see a lot of rejection here. Chapter 12, we see rejection by the Pharisees over the issue of what? Okay, the Sabbath. Yeah, doing anything on the Sabbath. Really? The Sabbath was a big issue for the Pharisees, and Jesus <laughs> came up against that. That's one of the things he um, uh, came, uh, he, he talked about. Just keeping these legalistic rules to keep the Sabbath was not keeping the Sabbath in your heart. And then we have the parables of the kingdom. In chapter 13, then in 14, we have the rejection by Herod. 14, the rejection by the scribes and Pharisees. And we see here some ministry to the Gentiles. Now, let me stop and say this. Um, It's interesting in Matthew because we've talked about Matthew was written by a Jew 
four Jews or two Jews. But there are a lot of surprising episodes in here. Matthew saw that he was writing to the Jews to let them know that Jesus was the long-anticipated Messiah, but you see a lot of evidences of Jesus' ministry, or a good many evidences of Jesus' ministry to Gentiles. So what is Matthew saying by that? He's saying that the message is for the Jews, but it's also for the Gentiles. And he's trying to tell the Jews that, you know, that Jesus came not only for the Jews, he came to fulfill all righteousness in terms of the Jewish history, but it's not just for Jews, it's for Gentiles as well. So you see this, um, we'll, we'll point out the kind of surprising people that Jesus interacts with and, and how uh, Matthew incorporates those into his gospel. It's not just about the healing of Jews or the salvation of Jews. It's also about Gentiles. And then um, in chapter 16 is a real turning point in the gospel, in this gospel, um, because you see the rejection by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And here, Jesus takes the opportunity to turn to his disciples and say, well, you know, who do you think I am? And that's a real turning point in the gospel, in chapter 16. So you see the... Um, now, this does not follow our repetition, but uh, rejection of the Messiah. In those, in those chapters, rejection of the Messiah. Now, I said that chapter 16 was a crucial turning point in the gospel, and it's, it's, uh, it's really a turning point that we all must have in our own lives. As, you know, it's not just, here's a message out there, but you know, how are we going to respond to that message individually? And um, after that, Peter, Peter, of course, you know, it would be Peter, um, blurts out, you know, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And uh, after that point, the disciples are pretty much on board with that. Jesus' focus becomes more of preparing the disciples for what is going to happen. And he, his ministry, he's still preaching to crowds, but he's really, a lot of times he will um, make a parable, for example, the parable of, um, of the sower, and the seeds, um, he will give that parable to the multitudes, but he the explanation is to the disciples. And so he is really focusing on working with those disciples to uh, grow them up. He tells them over and over again that of what's going to happen. You know, it takes them a long time. Well, they never got so they understood what was going to happen even though he told them over and over again. Um, so we have here in chapters um, 17 through 20, I'm trying to keep my color straight here. Um, preparation of the disciples. Back to our P. And here we have in chapter 18, we have more teaching, another discourse on what it means to be a disciple. And, uh, and there are more parables here in these chapters. Beginning in chapter 17, what happens in chapter 17? This is, I will tell you, chapter 16 comes right before chapter 17. Did y'all know that? <laughs> <laughs> chapter 16 is where 
Peter says, you are the Christ. And then the very next chapter, chapter 17, what do we have? Okay, so after Peter proclaims who Jesus is, he has this uh, magnificent experience on top of the mountain, which he doesn't have any concept how to respond to that. Um, it's totally beyond his uh, thinking level. Um, and it is preparing him to see Jesus in a new way and to see um, the mission in a new way. And then you have a bunch of, of teachings, um, faith about his death, taxes, humility, causing offense, forgiveness, divorce, wealth, his death. Once again, he keeps telling them about his coming death and ambition. All, all of those teaching things in there, you don't need to write all those down. In those chapters, um, in 17 through 20. Almost every chapter is about the kingdom of heaven. I mean, it's a description of the kingdom. And he refers, he uses that term, kingdom of heaven. In that time, the kingdom of heaven, you know, the Jews, um, you know, the, the um, I guess it's the second commandment, is about the name of God and how the name of God is holy. You have to be very careful not to use the name of God in in a wrong way or without um, respect. And so um, a lot of the Jews became afraid to even say the word God, which I mean, for them was not God. I mean, it was Yahweh. So they didn't even say that word. And so they would use other words to refer to God. Okay. So in saying the kingdom of heaven, that was their way of saying the kingdom of God. Okay, because they didn't want to say the name of God and make offense. So, um, so whenever Matthew uses that term, kingdom of heaven, you'll see in the other gospels they don't use that term. But, but remember, Matthew's writing to Jews, and so for them, kingdom of heaven was a more meaningful way to write. But in the other gospels that, like Luke, was written to Gentiles, he could say kingdom of God there, and it didn't. It wasn't a point of offense. So, just as an aside, a little bit about the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, Kitty? What do you think is the point of transfiguration? Why, why did that happen? Why well, was it Moses? And well, we're, we're going to talk about that when we get to it. Okay, so you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. Okay, so here he is focusing on the, the uh, preparation of these disciples because, you know, he's not just throwing it out there for everybody, he's working with the people that are going to carry on, the 12. And, and then there were, there were some other bystanders that were being, a, lot, a bunch of women were following around, following Jesus around. And um, well, they were here. It was transfiguration. I didn't get 17. 17. 17 was transfiguration. That was right after 16. So if you can remember 16 and 17, yeah, you know, 17 was right after 16. Okay. Um, so um, in chapter um, 21, really through 27, and we talked last week, and, I, and some of you, I think, um, got my little um, numbers chart in the mail. If you yes. wanted it, nobody has to have it if you don't want it. Um, the last week takes up from 21 really through 28. That's the last week because 21 begins with a triumphal entry. Um, and um, it's a, what did I, how much, what percentage did I say? 38 or something like that percent of um, the gospel is the last week. And so you, you all know a lot of the events in the last week, um, the, the triumphal entry, um, and then he's having increasing conflict with the, um, the leaders in Jerusalem. 
the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and you know the you know about the Sadducees. You know, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And that's the, the reason they're sad. You see, um, so that that helps me remember it. Um, but those two groups did not get along with each other at all. They were really diametrically opposed. But they got together about Jesus. They both were against him. And then um, we have twenty four and twenty five. This is called the. The Olivet Discourse. And all that means is that it happened on the Mount of Olives. That's the reason it's called the Olivet Discourse. And uh, he's, Jesus is t- teaching his disciples about things in the future that are going to happen, some of which were to happen around the time of his uh, death, and some of which would happen later. Some things would happen in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. Some things have not happened yet. And they're all kind of mixed in there together. You know. So remember, time doesn't really make a lot of difference. Right? To somebody who's eternal. (laughs) Would you say those chapters are deal a lot with judgment and what I mean, they, they do, so he's explaining what happens if you don't argue. Yeah, we don't hear, hear this too much in church, but Jesus is also judge and um, at the end. And so, um, you know, our Jesus, gentle and mild, is, is, is sometimes is, is uh, severe. Uh, I mean, there is a point that you know he he offers salvation to people and if people don't accept it there's judgment uh, and, and and our world doesn't like to hear that you know because everybody's way is just very nice there's no there's didn't neither and more and more uh, in, in our culture, you know, I was we were watching Jeopardy the other night. I mean, you know, how 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 difficult can Jeopardy be, you know? But um, you know, then the people that were on there, I mean, they had all these people from these, you know, nobody was married to anybody, and and they were all in these weird relationships. And I thought, you know, there it is, right there. That's a picture of our society. It's fine for everybody to do everything. Mm-hmm. And God loves them all, you know. Yes. And so that is just not what Scripture teaches. I mean, it's a, it's a hard lesson. And, of course, we want to welcome people in. And we wel- Jesus forgives. He forgives all that. We have to ask to be forgiven. We have to realize that we need to be forgiven. And uh, th- that's the thing about the law. The law helps us realize that we need a Savior. That's the reason for the law. Uh, without the law, we don't know we need a Savior. And we just roll right along. And, um, you know, Jesus came to be our Savior. And we need to acknowledge that we need saving. I don't know about you, but I, I need it every day. <laughs> Not just... Albert. One time when I decided back when I was, you know, 10 years old, I needed every day. So, um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Nancy. There is a lot about judgment there, and it's we're uncomfortable with that, majorly, um, but it's a part of the message. And that's the reason that, that's one of the reasons I like to study the Bible this way, because we can't just not deal with certain issues. Uh, And we got to look at all the verses that are there. We may not understand all the verses that are there or what they actually mean, but we've at least got to look at them, and some of them make us, uh, (coughs) as Richard would say, seriously uncomfortable. And we've got to deal with that and and figure out how that fits in. Well, really, hadn't had us do that exercise, I wouldn't have noticed, you know, 
because we're all the, the emphasis near the end of his life is this is it. Let me say this. Uh, um, you know, the message starts out real sweet at first. It's all nice and, and sweetness. And, um, well, it's really not. But on a superficial level, you know, it's blessed are these and blessed are those and blessed are those. And then towards the end, you know, some of these parables are um, hard. are hard. They're difficult. And, and, and that's the way it becomes. Um, for us, as we go along deeper in our relationship with him, we grapple with issues. We, Kathy and I have been talking, she, she's my student minister, you all know that. And uh, we, we've had, um, as a matter of fact, we get together and, and it's about a three-hour session every time <laughs> because we both have lots of things to, uh, to grapple with. And as you go along in your faith, it's not that it gets easier um, it, there are blessings, but, you know, the Lord wants us to deal with some difficult issues. And he helps us through those issues, and he blesses us in the process. But um, some of the issues are tough. And so I, I just want to make you aware that if you are facing things and, and it's, it's challenging and it's difficult, the Lord is working in you his purposes through those things. It's not something to, to run away and hide under the bed about. It's as we give these things to him, then he can work miracles in our hearts. And what he's trying to do is make us look more and more like Jesus. You know, those fruit of the Spirit towards the end, you know, I don't like those too much. Self-control. Who likes that? Who likes... Patience. I mean, we like it when somebody else is patient toward us, but do we really want to develop patience or faithfulness to hang in there when it's tough? So, um, yeah, things get... Um, a lot of that judgment is towards the end, and it's meant for the disciples to understand. Um, am I, is that making sense to you guys? But okay. also, I'll say, you know, when we did the study of John, and John, his last chapters are all red. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> when I had to teach that, I thought, well, you know, we pay attention when someone is dying to their last words. And so that's why, as Jesus, I think, approached this crucifixion, he wanted so much to get his message for his disciples to understand. And they didn't understand it at the time. But later on, after they had the Holy Spirit in their hearts, they looked back. And, and that's when they, at the time, they didn't understand when Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. But later on, they remembered that he had said that. And that's the reason they're in the gospel. But at the time, it went over their head. They weren't comprehending it. And then, of course, the very last chapter is the proof of the Messiah. So let's see if we've got all of the We've got all of the discourses marked with stars out beside them. And that's kind of an outline of the book. So when you when we're taking each individual passage, we can kind of know where we're plugging in and what... Uh... Now, as you go through, when you get the next lesson... Uh, probably next week I'll give it to you. I'm going to I'm going to bring in a worksheet for you. It's called Worksheet A, and it's not going to be numbered. Okay, it's not going to have a page number on it because you need to just keep it available every week as you do your studies. And what Worksheet A is going to have on it? Uh, the first column is the reference in Matthew. You'll put what verse or verses it is. It could be several verses. 
And then you'll put the next column is the Old Testament reference, and the next is the subject. And then I've given you a place for Evelyn for <laughs> additional comments. <laughs> but what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to um, put in the the, new, the Matthew reference and then the Old Testament reference that shows every time Jesus is fulfilling a messianic expectation from the Old Testament. And so you're going to need several of these pages in order to list them all as we go through. So every time we do a lesson, and a lot of times I will say to you, um, you know, fill in uh, worksheet A, and you're going to know what worksheet A is. It's entitled... Jesus, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And when you finish, you may have three or four pages of that, and um, you will have all of those from Matthew. Won't that be exciting to have that piece of paper? I want to say one thing. All right, Ann. Just one. <laughs> the more I study, I have always felt sorry for the Jewish people because they centuries they have thought about the Old Testament. And here they become these few people that's going to mess everything up. Well, they didn't understand it correctly. No, they didn't. And you know, we can do the same thing. The church has done this through the centuries. And that's the reason, uh, you know, I'm going to teach the Bible and I'm going to teach it book by book. That's what I'm committed to. Everybody else might go somewhere else and, and study other books that are written. And there's some good books out there that are written about things. But I'm not into studying books except for the book. And I'm, I'm committed to studying it by, by book within the, so that we can't skip over the things that make us uncomfortable. And um, we, have to, we have to look at it all. We, like I said, we may not understand it all. Probably we won't. But at least we have to, to look at all those verses and figure out, well, what does this mean? We have to look at the judgment passages as well as the feel-good passages because they're both in there. And the good news is that all the suffering that Jesus went through and later his disciples went through and the, the suffering that we go through has purpose in his kingdom. Did you hear that? The suffering that we go through now, not suffering because we've done something wrong and we suffer because of that, but when we suffer, we are participating in his suffering. And he's trying to grow us. He's trying to make us more like him. And that is a process that we don't finish until the end. Our end you know, when we go to heaven, that we're finished then. But... Um, no matter how old we are, what condition we're in, we're still growing. Well, I mean, we can be still growing. We can be still growing. Doesn't mean we are, but we can be. So that's my challenge to you is, um, you know, this is, this is a story that has a good, bad ending. We know that it was a good, a good ending for us, but it was a hard ending for Christ until the resurrection. But um, that's, and, and we know the end of the story. You know, we're going through, the disciples didn't know the end of the story when they were going through it. Any comments about the outline or anything that we've said? One thing he said, if I could just, uh, I just want to make sure that I get it in my head correctly. I'm one of those people who needs to hear things twice before it sinks in. Uh, you said you had a teacher one time who said, who gave advice, or who, who made the comment that Jesus lived 33 years because it took that long for him to experience all of the sins of the world. That, this is my interpretation. The sins of the world. Okay, I, I made I made this comment in our Sunday school class, which I, I guess, or was it last week? Yes. Thirty three years of perfection. Okay, thirty. Well, he was and is the Messiah, 
But the 33 years was to prove that he really was the Messiah. You understand that? Um, he had, to, it said that he learned, um, he learned obedience. It's not that he learned obedience. He proved obedience um, by the 33 years. If he had come as a little tiny baby and been the sacrifice of the world and had never experienced temptation or evil or any of those things, we would say, well, that, that's not a big deal because he didn't, he wouldn't, we don't know if he was perfect or not because he hadn't proved it. But for his 33 years, he lived a sinless life. He proved, and that's what Matthew was pointing out, he proved that he was the Messiah by the things that he did and the way he lived and just who he was. He didn't act like other people around him. He didn't teach like other people around him. And he turned our thinking upside down. And he still does. you know, Because we get real content with yeah. certain ways of thinking and sometimes we have to have our, our mold broken so that we can be remolded. So, does that help you, Gail? It does. Yeah. If he hadn't lived for those 33 years of perfection to show that he was the Messiah, then we wouldn't have any way to know that. He proved it. He proved his Messiahship, his perfection. But he knew he was the Messiah, but he did that so we would know he was the Messiah. And he didn't just come right out and say, well, I'm the Messiah. I mean, anybody can say anything. Yeah. But when you've lived your life 33 years a certain way, that, that shows who you are and what you believe. Right? Because, like, you know, and, and, and in fact, he did almost the opposite. He, he didn't come in and say, well, I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah. No. They would have gotten rid of him right away. And he wouldn't have had the chance to live the 33 years to prove it and to show it to us. So, um, you know, it was all about God's timing, um, the timing of his birth. But then, you know, there were several times when he, he was headed towards Jerusalem and he decided not to go down there because it wasn't his time yet. John talks a lot about that. It says it wasn't his time yet. And then finally, it was his time to go to Jerusalem because he knew that when he went to Jerusalem, that time he was going to die. One time he went to Jerusalem in John's Gospel, um, um, hidden. He didn't go with fanfare. He kind of snuck in, you know. He kind of snuck in. Uh, because he didn't want the attention on him to force things before his time. Any other questions? Thank you, Gail, for bringing that up. Any other? I'm going to let you out a little bit early today. How about that? Uh, let's pray before we leave. Father, we thank you so much for your word because we understand who you are through reading your word. You speak to our hearts. I pray this week that as we all study together this, these first bits in Matthew, that you will speak deeply into our inmost hearts, that you will reveal who you are to us, and that we will respond to you with faithful obedience. We love you, Lord, for who you are and for all that you have done. And we pray that you will bless us and make us a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes,